Gaius Livius Salinator, Consul 188 BCE. The son of a rather infamous consul from the Second Punic War, Gaius Livius Salinator seems to have exceeded his father in talent, while also having a temperament far better suited to the vicissitudes of Roman politics. As praetor in 191 BCE, Livius went east to serve as Rome's fleet commander in the Aegean during the Roman Seleucid War. While his naval victory at Kisos did not lead to naval supremacy, it was Rome's greatest victory at sea in half a century and left Rome and its allies in a great position for the following year's campaign. Returning to the region as an envoy, Livius also pulled off a diplomatic coup by persuading Bithynia to join the Roman cause, thus doing a great deal to pave the road to the Battle of Magnesia and the end of the Seleucid presence north of the Taurus Mountains. Gaius's father was Marcus Livius Salinator, a man who served twice as consul and once as censor. The first time he served as consul, Marcus was drummed out of the Senate after corruption charges. However, after the annihilation of much of the Senate, he was readmitted in 210 and even became consul again in 207. The year he was consul, he served with a young man named Gaius Claudius Nero, and he was one of the co-commanders at the Battle of the Metaurus. In fact, Livius's forces were the larger of the two that took part in the Battle of the Metaurus, but a lot of the credit ended up going to Claudius Nero because of his forced march from the south to reinforce Livius's army prior to the confrontation with Hasdrubal. That, of course, was one of the more decisive battles of the war, and so, as you can imagine, Gaius took great pride in his heritage. Later on, Marcus became censor in 204 with the same colleague he had been consul with, Gaius Claudius Nero. The two of them feuded in a way that most Romans found to be shameful, and it was Marcus who took most of the opprobrium for this dispute, earning the cognomen Salinator for getting so salty over the salt tax. Despite this, however, Gaius seems to have been rather proud of his father and proudly used the cognomen Salinator as if it were something other than an insult. That being said, while Gaius seems to have been cut from the same cloth in terms of his ability, he did not, so far as we can tell, share his father's more difficult character traits. So far as we can tell from the surviving evidence, Gaius Livius Salinator always got along amicably enough with his colleagues and was even a compliment, uh, competent diplomat. When he was elected praetor in 191, Gaius's father was still alive, so Gaius's father Marcus would have wished him good luck as he went off to the east in order to command ships and to partake in a foreign war against the Seleucid Empire, a war that was becoming increasingly dangerous as there were rumors that Hannibal might now be involved. Most likely by this time, however, Gaius was already a hardened veteran, even if he was not yet very old. Just like all men of his generation, he would have grown up fighting in the Second Punic War, especially in the later stages, and this means also that he, like many of his contemporaries, was probably a bit younger than the normal age for a praetor. So your average praetor is about 37 or so at the time when they serve, if they are elected at the first possible year of eligibility. Gaius my guess would be is probably not much more than 30, just based on the norms of the Senate in the decade or two after the Second Punic War. The overwhelming majority of the evidence that we have about Gaius Livius Salinator's career comes from his time as praetor and fleet commander. Most praetorships are fairly uneventful, or at the very least, the events that occur have not come down to us. That being said, Gaius Livius Salinator's praetorship is easily the most memorable part of his career. As soon as he was elected, he raised a force of 50 new Roman quinquiremes and set off for the east. Here, he combined his forces with those of the existing admiral in the theater, Aulus Attilius Serenus, who had a fleet of 20 stationed at Piraeus. This would give Livius some 70 ships under his command, 70 heavy warships. Livius was instructed to make up his numbers and achieve parity or superiority by working alongside of the Adelid and Rhodian fleets. Both of these fleets were quite a bit smaller than either the Roman or Seleucid, but both of them were of good quality, especially the Rhodian fleet, which was easily the best, at least in terms of quality, 
during the Hellenistic period. The two great sources of the Roman Seleucid conflict, and therefore for the life of Gaius Livius Salinator himself, are Polybius and Livy. In the true Greco-Roman tradition of historiography, both men are confirmed landlubbers and don't go too deep in the details about naval operations. So because of that, Livius's orders are not really relayed to the reader. And so we're left to ponder what exactly he was trying to accomplish with his fleet. John D. Granger, the great historian of the Hellenistic East, who has written a trilogy on the Seleucid Empire, in addition to books on things like the Syrian Wars between the Seleucids and Ptolemies, and who is currently working on a trilogy on the Ptolemies. And by the way, I recommend reading pretty much anything he ever, he's ever written. He's an excellent historian. He believes that Livius's orders were to seek out and win a major fleet action in order to clear the way for the next year's consuls to land in Seleucid Asia. I believe Granger has a plausible case. However, I think a more plausible case is that Rome, being aware that the Seleucid Empire had vast resources, was primarily concerned with making sure that they kept Antiochus out of Greece. They wanted to give Glabrio a free hand to finish off the Aetolians before marching into Thrace. Most likely, they were anticipating that Antiochus would resist in Thrace, where he had been campaigning for several years prior to his invasion of Greece, and where he had built up a fairly strong following. It would make sense for him to use Thrace as a buffer, and also he had the great city of Lysimachia, which was an important port and also a large fortified populated center. He had spent a lot of time and treasure building it back up. So most likely the ideal scenario would be that Livius would keep the Seleucids out, and if he was lucky enough to win a major battle, he might try to rapidly seize Lysimachia, but that would be more of a bonus objective, or at least that is my reading of the situation. But again, no one tells us explicitly what Livius's orders are, so we're left to guess and to work on probabilities and possibilities. At Piraeus, Livius assembled his full fleet. He now had some 70 Roman quinquiremes, along with a small number of Carthaginian ships. These ships were perhaps three in number, which would represent around a third of the Carthaginian navy at this point, and I'm sure the Punic sailors were none too happy to be there. After all, they had to be there by treaty obligation, and in the event, they wouldn't really fight that well. When Livius sailed north, he arrived at the island of Delos and received intelligence reports that Antiochus was present nearby at Lysimachia in Thrace. Here, Antiochus was in personal command of his fleet. Livius, who up to this point had never commanded at sea, so far as we know, probably didn't think that it would be wise to take on the wily old Antiochus. Although Antiochus had no real experience at sea, he had been a successful general for about three decades at this point, and his defeat at Thermopylae had been somewhat of a fluke, as he had basically had the battle won before things went awry. In fact, other than at Thermopylae, Antiochus had lost very few battles in his career, and the last major defeat he had suffered had been all the way back in 217 BCE. Livius decided to pause on Delos for three weeks, and it's not entirely clear why. The sources say that he was waiting for the Atesian winds to pass, but that doesn't quite seem like a sufficient explanation. Granger has a pretty good suggestion. He thinks that perhaps Livius was using the time to communicate with his Rhodian and Pergamene allies to make sure they coordinated their efforts. However, I think that one of the major reasons, and again, I'm referring back to my theory as to what his orders were, that his purpose by going to Delos was to be nearby to monitor Antiochus's fleet and also have enough time to deploy and react to any move Antiochus might make. So he was effectively trying to check Antiochus's progress in case he tried to sail south to get back into Greece. Eventually, Livius's hand would be freed when Antiochus withdrew his fleet to Ephesus. And when he arrived in Ephesus, he left the fleet and put Polyxenetus in charge. At this time, Polyxenetus, 
while someone while he was someone who was clearly trusted by Antiochus, was largely an unknown quantity and hadn't really shown up in the sources before. That being said, as a friend of the king, he would have been someone who most likely had accompanied Antiochus on a number of campaigns and presumably was someone who knew his way around a ship, at least by Seleucid standards. And again, it's worth mentioning that much like the Romans, the Seleucids did not have much of a naval tradition. And most of the ships in the Seleucid fleet were fairly new. And this is really the first time the Seleucids had, had a major fleet in their entire history. So this only dates to the time of Antiochus III. Before him, there really wasn't much of a Seleucid fleet to speak of. Learning that the Seleucid fleet had withdrawn to Ephesus, Livius decided to mount a pursuit. Once again, I believe that his primary instructions were to prevent the Seleucids from regaining access to Europe. And the best way to do that would be to confront them as far away from Europe as possible. He also may have feared losing sight of the Seleucids in case they decided to load their ships up with troops and give him the slip. Intercepting an enemy fleet, if you don't know where they're at and you're not monitoring them, is extraordinarily difficult under ancient conditions. So Livius pursued to Asia, and this also gave him an excellent opportunity to bolster his numbers and to gain an edge. So qualitatively, the Roman and Seleucid fleets were not all that different. Both of them had mostly new ships of the heavy variety, and both fleets were also relatively inexperienced. But by gaining a numerical edge, Livius would now have a pretty good chance of prevailing. The Seleucid commander, Polyxenetus, did not want to fight Livius outnumbered. And so he wanted to intercept Livius prior to his arrival in Pergamon, but he was unsuccessful. Livius was able to reach Pergamon and link up with the Adelid ships, thus boosting his strength all the way to 105. So now he had both a larger fleet in terms of numbers and in terms of the average weight of warship. That being said, things could still get worse for Polyxenetus, so he still wanted to fight even if the odds were now not with him. Because Livius's other ally, the Rhodians, were on the way, and while they would not boost the fleet but by another 30 or so ships, their ships were far and away the best in the eastern Mediterranean, and they would give Livius an advantage that Polyxenetus probably could not overcome. So he decided to confront the inexperienced Roman commander prior to the arrival of the Rhodians. And this would lead to a pitched battle. Livius's crossing to Asia had given him the strategic advantage with the acquisition of the Adelid fleet. However, it would seem that some tactical advantages still lay with the Seleucid fleet. Polyxenetus, for instance, seems to have been better at scouting. So he was able to locate the Allied fleet and to engage it on his own terms at a place called Kissus. The place of the battle is also called Coricus in some accounts. This battle would take place in September of 191. Polyxenetus would detect the Roman and Adelid fleets and he chose his moment to where he could strike against just the Romans with the Adelids behind them out of support distance. The idea was to defeat the Romans and then overwhelm the smaller Adelid contingent. It was a risky strategy, but it was certainly better than fighting all at once when the Allied fleet would flank around him and potentially surround him. So it was a fairly solid strategy on Polyxenetus' part. Initially, he does seem to have been succeeding. The first casualty of the battle was where the Seleucids were able to seize one of the Carthaginian ships. My suspicion is that the Carthaginians did not fight very hard and surrendered without much of a fight. One of the ships was towed off in safety all the way back to Ephesus. However, in the meantime, the ship towing it off would have been pretty useful to have, as once the boarding actions began, the Romans proved that while they were amateurs at sea, they were pretty good in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. By this point, the Romans were not equipping their ships with the Corvus because the Corvus was a rather cumbersome tool despite its usefulness and it led to ships sinking. Nonetheless, with their grappling hooks, they were still able to overwhelm the Seleucid ships. They probably had more men on board and on the decks. And so once the hand-to-hand -hand fighting began, the Romans prevailed. 
It's worth noting that none of the Hellenistic fleets, not even the Rhodians, had a sufficient level of skill to um, reliably ram other ships. So the level of skill involved in these Hellenistic fleet actions is a pale reflection of what the Athenians had once had. During the battle, 13 Seleucid ships were captured with their crews, meaning that there were rowers in the galleys, and another 10 were sunk. In the meantime, only that one Carthaginian ship that was completely useless had been captured, and so this was a pretty solid, albeit not quite decisive, victory for the Romans. The decisiveness of most decisive battles is derived from the pursuit, and in the case of the Battle of Kisos, there was no real pursuit to speak of. Polyxenetus was able to get his fleet away and retreat to Ephesus, where he began immediately to rebuild. In the meantime, Livius was not in the best position to try to follow up the victory, and even if he had taken his full strength immediately to the Hellespont, there wasn't all that much to be done. The simple fact of the matter is that Scipio's army was not present yet. We're not sure exactly where it was, but it certainly was not in Thrace and in a position to cross. Most likely, Scipio's army was just arriving in Greece, and there's even the possibility that at the time of the battle, it was actually still mustering in Italy. And so, Kisos never had any real chance of becoming one of the great battles. In the meantime, Antiochus knew that his navy would need some time to heal, and so he and his son, the crown prince Seleucus, were campaigning on the coast. This required Livius to disperse his strength to some degree, so he had to dispatch a few ships here, a few ships there. And in the meantime, while he was supporting his allies by doing this, Antiochus also made things more difficult for them by hiring some pirates to raid the Aegean, so Livius had to dispatch more ships to deal with that. At the same time, he even had to send a few ships just to fetch his successor, as we'll see when we get to the life of Aemilius Regulus. At the same time, Antiochus also ordered yet another fleet to be commissioned in Phoenicia, which was safely away from the battlefield and would provide him with reliable ships. Of course, Phoenicia has a long history of naval excellence, even if it is mostly in the realms of merchant shipping and then exploration rather than battle. And for this new fleet, Antiochus finally appointed the man who had come to him as a refugee a couple years earlier, Hannibal Barca of Carthage. So Hannibal himself was now in Phoenicia raising a new fleet. So Livius knew that the Roman fleet would have to try conclusions once again with the Seleucid navy and that ultimately it was a temporary victory that he had earned at Kisos. In the meantime, he wanted to prevent Polyxenetus from effectively rebuilding his fleet, so he did use his reduced force to try to land at Ephesus, but these landings failed and didn't really achieve that much except for some casualties in terms of personnel. Another setback was that at one point the Rhodians were doing guard duty at Ephesus and Polyxenetus sallied out and captured 20 ships. This was a pretty major deal because the Rhodians had probably 60 or so ships total, and so this was a huge coup for them. This also meant that the excellent Rhodian navy had had its effectiveness reduced by a fair amount. So you can imagine that Livius and his successor were probably rather nervous going into the 190 campaign season because of what had happened. Livius's tenure as the Praetorian fleet commander extended for a couple months after his office had expired due to the problem of trying to fetch his replacement, Lucius Aemilius Regulus. Once Regulus did arrive and assumed command, Livius, possibly on his own authority, journeyed as a private citizen to Caria in order to investigate rumors of what Hannibal might be up to in Phoenicia. On his way home, he then met with the Scipio brothers who were now marching through Thrace and briefed them on his findings. He then returned to Rome to report to the Senate, but the Senate almost immediately sent him back to the Aegean. Here he would be working as a diplomat directly on instructions from the Senate, and his mission was an important one, as we'll see. His selection for this role probably owes to him having this known experience in the Aegean, 
and also because Hannibal was now involved. So normally the Romans would try to do some internal competition politically, even while at war. Certainly there had been efforts among many in the Senate, including Cato the Elder, to hold back the career of Scipio Africanus after the Second Punic War. However, now that Hannibal was involved, the Romans weren't fucking around. And so that is why they had selected Scipio's brother as consul, so that way Scipio himself would be present once again. And if you have someone like Livia Salinator, who is now a proven quantity, someone who has won a naval battle and been an effective theater commander, you want to send him back, so that way he can lend his area expertise, such as it is, to this diplomatic mission. Since around 200 or so, Antiochus III had been heavily engaged in Asia Minor, trying to end the independence of his neighbors there. It was only because he got interested in Thrace and later in Greece that his neighbors had had a reprieve. Now that he was back in Asia, the threat remained, and for most of the powers of Asia Minor, it was clear that the Seleucids were the bigger and more immediate threat than the Romans. So. The job of Roman diplomats was not necessarily impossible when it came to courting support. However, they would need to demonstrate that Rome could actually reach Asia and would show up when called upon. And so Livius, as a recently successful commander who had commanded a mobile naval force, was a pretty ideal exemplar of the kind of help that the Romans could offer. He was selected, therefore, to go east and meet with King Prusius I the Lame of Bithynia. As a young man, Prusius had badly injured his leg, so his mobility was now pretty limited, and so that is why he is Prusius the Lame. We don't know what his musical taste was like, but probably fairly typical for a man of that era. Anyhow, uh, Prusius was under quite a bit of diplomatic pressure from the Seleucids, and up to this point it looked like he would join with Antiochus in exchange for some territory, but Livius was able to persuade him to stay neutral. And so because of Prusius's shift in attitude, this was a major diplomatic coup. Because this would deprive Antiochus of a number of allied forces, and it would also mean that it would be easier for the Romans to land in Asia. Potentially, they could even land in Bithynian territory, although that was not their first resort. Antiochus III also no longer trusted the Bithynians, and so because of Prusius's change of heart, he actually detached some of his men to face the border, just in case the Bithynians got any ideas. So this meant that the army that Antiochus would use at Magnesia would be at least a few thousand men smaller because of his fear of the Bithynians. In the meantime, Livius also went to this port city of Heraclea Pontici in order to arrange for a treaty of Amakitia, or friendship. This city had been threatened by Antiochus for his entire tenure in Asia Minor, and both he and some of his generals, including his son Seleucus, had attempted a number of different campaigns to capture the city. So this city feared very much for its independence, and it was only because of Livius' assurances that the city agreed to become a Roman ally and potentially become the landing place for Scipio's army. So this was a major pickup as well and would be directly relevant to the upcoming operation. In theory, of course, the main diplomatic effort was by Scipio Africanus, who was serving as legate for his brother, the future Scipio Asiaticus. But in reality, those negotiations were largely just for show. Scipio Africanus met with Antiochus's main um, envoy, and the two of them just kind of shot the breeze with the Seleucid terms probably being somewhat genuine in terms of being willing to give up on all of Europe, and the Roman terms being that he would have to give up way more than that now that he had waged war against the Romans and they had won a few battles. So we could also argue that because of even the battle at Cesus, that the Romans had become more ambitious and that they were looking to achieve more with their victory. So the Romans were bent on seeking a decisive land battle and Livius would do a great deal both his fleet commander and his diplomat to make sure that that eventually happened. And as we all know, the war would end in early 189 when the Roman army would prevail at Magnesia and in the resulting treaty, the Seleucids would withdraw together altogether from 
Asia Minor, north of the Taurus Mountains, never to return. Not long after his successful mission to the Bithynians and to the Greek cities of Asia Minor, Gaius Livius Salinator returned home. Soon thereafter, he ran for and won the office of consul alongside of Marcus Valerius Massala. Interestingly enough, both men were primarily known at this point for their activities as admirals, with Valerius Massala having served as a fleet commander as early as 210. Therefore, Valerius must have been a fair amount older than Livius Salinator. As for the elder Livius Salinator, Marcus, old Salty himself, he most likely was dead by this point, although it is possible, just barely possible, that he did live long enough to see his son become consul. And given that he was old enough to have been consul as early as 219, this would mean that he was a very old man indeed by the standards of this era. As for 188 itself, we don't really know that much about what the two consuls did. The year was not all that eventful. Most likely, the most exciting thing that happened was that this was the first year that Antiochus III was forced to pay part of his war indemnity to the Roman Senate. So the defeat at Magnesia had occurred in early 189, and payments would have started the following year in 188. So Gaius Livius Salinator, because he took part in the war, most likely had the honor of presiding over a ceremony where this tribute was formally received and dedicated to one of Rome's temples. I don't think it's a controversial statement to say that the generation of Gaius Livius Salinator, that is to say the generation of men who grew up fighting the Second Punic War and went on to hold office in the 190s and 180s, was easily the most competent generation of Roman senators to ever live. In fact, you could even call it Rome's greatest generation. These were both the best common soldiers and the best commanders that Rome would ever field. While a few of these men were truly brilliant, and I mean, let's face it, there weren't all that many brilliant men in any given generation, all of them were competent, and none of them failed. And Gaius Livius Salinator is a great example of that. He did not manage to reproduce Meli, but at the same time, he was fighting the first major naval battle that Rome had engaged in in 50 years, and getting a W is what mattered. He managed to do that. Had he not won, then Rome would have had to deploy even more naval assets to the Aegean in order to effect a landing, and given a victory, this would have really helped the Seleucid cause in terms of winning over allies. Perhaps without Livius's actions, Bithynia would have never gone Roman. And so, even though the Battle of Kisos was not decisive, it still was rather significant. Let's not lose fact of its significance simply because the Battle of Myonesis the next year was more important. Livius did not manage to win the war at sea, but he did his duty and he left the fleet in good hands. His successor was then able to finish the job without any additional reinforcements because Livius had kept the navy intact and his casualties had been light. However, I think that it is by far more significant in terms of what he did as a diplomat, because he was able to use both his victory and the victory of his successor at Myonesis in order to win over the Bithynians and the city of Heraclea Pontica. This limited Antiochus's strategic options, forced him to divide his forces, so Livius effectively returned to favor Antiochus, of course, had earlier divided Livius's forces by attacking uh, various Roman allies, and this conduced to the great victory at Magnesia, which of course would leave Rome as the sole superpower in the Mediterranean. So even if Livius's name is not first on our list of people who are responsible for Rome's victory in the conflict with the Seleucids, he is definitely among the most responsible parties for Rome's success.